Hello and welcome back to Clinical Research Method. Today, um, I'd like to introduce you to the inferential statistics. Um, as you probably know, many research rely on a single uh, sample, um, assuming that they're randomly drawn from the population with a handful number of patients, subjects, participants, cell lines, and so on. But if we think about it, why do people conduct their research with the sample? It is not like they are interested in the specific individuals in the sample, are they? Unless you are interested in very rare cases or phenomena on their own, the reason for studying a sample in general is not to learn about the individuals in the sample, but rather to infer certain population characteristics that the sample represents. So depending upon what you want to do with statistics, the goal of statistical analysis can be either uh, descriptive or inferential, where descriptive statistics is mainly about describing the sample characteristics by summarizing and visualizing to better understand the data collected and measured from a sample, which is what we have done so far in the exploratory data analysis. On the other hand, uh, the goal of, uh, goal of the inferential statistics um, is to make an inference about the population of which characteristic is represented by the sample. And understandably, one of the practical reasons why we study a sample is that the population is typically too big to study and we only have limited resources in terms of time and money. Typically, um, the size of a sample is only a tiny fraction of a population. And the question of inference uh, then is about quantifying our degree of confidence on um, how representative the sample is of the population. So let's consider um, Scottish population, uh, which is currently about 5.5 million people. Um, so here, the big N represents the number of population, not normal distributions. And um, here, say we take a sample from the Scottish population and here, the small n represents the size of the sample. So let's say that the population characteristic um, of potential research interest for vision scientists may be um, the intraocular pressure right, of the population. And you want to have a single number that is representative of or typical of Scottish population. So as we learned previously, an average or the mean can be one of the summer statistics we can use. But to calculate the mean uh, for the population, then we need to know every single intraocular pressure of all the members of population. And obviously, it is not feasible to measure and record the whole, you know, five and a half million IOPs. So instead, what's done in practice, um, is um, that we collect a small fraction of the population and then measure the IOP of the sample and estimate um, the population IOP from the uh, average sample IOP. So for example, let's say you have this sample of Scottish population with the size of 27, right? So you can see that this is a much doable now um, to measure 27 IOPs instead of some, you know, five and a half million IOPs. Now we can calculate the mean of the sample, which turned out to be 17.5 um, millimeter mercury. Then now the question is, how much confidence do we have about the unknown population mean uh, intraocular pressure based on the sample statistics we have at hand. 
So that is the question of the inferential statistics. How do we estimate the population characteristics from the given samples, um, uh, from the given sample and quantify our uncertainty or certainty about the um, estimate we have at hand? So here, the statistics is a characteristic of a sample and X bar, um, as we have learned previously, represents sample mean. And the goal of the inferential statistics is to estimate the population parameter mu. So population parameter. So parameter is the characteristic of the population, whereas uh, statistics is the characteristic of the sample. Now then the goal of the inferential statistics is to say something about the population parameter from the sample. And um, the parameter is typically um, denoted by these Greek letters. So mu represents population mean. The population mean. When x bar is sample mean. Okay, so here are the words that we used um, in the previous slides. Um, so here I'd like to have a brief definition of each of them. So uh, the uh, population population is a collection of all subjects, samples, or participants of interest. So in our example, um, our population uh, was the uh, people living in Scotland, right? So that is uh, the people living in Scotland and the parameter. Parameter is a summary characteristic of population. In our case, uh, it was the, uh, the mean population, IOP, uh, of uh, the people living in Scotland. And then from this population, we have a sample, right? Uh, which is a subset of the population of interest. So for example, say, um, the students from the clinical research method class can be a subset of the population of interest, even though it is not a random sample, um, technically speaking. But um, the statistics is a summary characteristic of the sample, right? So in this case, it's, it's going to be the sample mean of intraocular pressure of the, uh, the clinical research method class. And the subjects of this story is the, um, the units of sample on which characteristics are measured. So um individual students uh, uh will be uh, an example of the uh, subject in our case and then finally the variable that we are measuring which is the characteristic uh, which are being measured and or recorded um, in our cases intraocular pressure so let's go back to the problem of estimating the population intraocular pressure from a sample. So if you think about it, studying a sample mean seems kind of meaningless to find about the population average because every time we take a sample, um, here we assume the sample is drawn at random, the sample mean IOP, the, the, um, the, the average IOP of the sample will change because the members of sample will change, as you can see from here. Um, so then, you know, what can we say about the uh, population parameter from a sample statistics? Right. Um, so intuitively, we can say that we will have a better estimate of the population mean if we increase the sample size and then sample mean will approach to the population mean and it will become the population mean when the sample size becomes the size of the population. 
So long time ago, some genius mathematicians thought about this relationship between the sample size and the accuracy or the precision of a parameter estimation. So they thought, you know, is there any lawful behavior of sample mean given the size of the sample in relation to the true population mean from which the sample is drawn randomly to show how close or far away the sample mean is to or from the true population mean unknown to us. So when a large number of sample means with a same size are randomly drawn from a population, then um, the resulting distribution, uh, which is known as sampling distribution of the means show uh, the interesting mathematical properties that have uh, enabled us to create numerical methods that measure how much we should be confident that the sample represents the population we are studying. So for the uh, sake of illustration, um, let's pretend that we somehow know how the uh, population distribution look like, which is represented by the red curve here. So the um, population intraocular pressure are normally distributed with a mean of 17 millimeter mercury and a standard deviation of six millimeter mercury. So now imagine that we draw a thousand samples of size four from this population with replacement. Uh, meaning that after a member is selected at random from the population, then it is returned to the population, and then the next member is selected at random. So with replacement sampling, uh, there is still a chance for the first drawn member to be picked again. So having said that, now each time we select four members, then we finish collecting a sample in this kind of simulation. Okay, so for the sample, then we measure each member's intraocular pressure and calculate the sample mean. So, for example, here is our first um, sample mean of 17.5 millimeter mercury done. So next, uh, we put all these four members back to the population and draw another sample of four and measure the individual IOP and calculate the sample mean for the sample and this time um, the mean is 17 millimeter mercury so you repeat this procedure until you have thousandth uh, a thousandth sample of four which now has uh, a sample mean of 18. so of course uh, each sample mean will be different from each other because every sample is composed of different members of population have collected thousand sample means and we can construct a histogram of these sample means so this is the result of uh, what is called the sampling distribution of the mean which is depicted by uh, uh, the gray histogram in the middle so remember our population was known to uh, known to us already and then is represented by the red curve here Right. And the gray histogram is the histogram um, <clears throat> of the 1,000 sample means of size 4. So if we look at the histogram, it looks more or less normally distributed, with its center is on top of the population mean of 17. So this black line represents the mean or the center of uh, the sampling distribution of the mean, which is this one. So that's this histogram, right? So that looks like a normally distributed, and the center of this histogram is actually right on top of uh, the population mean of 17. So this center of the histogram represents 
the mean of the sample means, not the mean of a sample. Okay, so uh, this is different from just a, a, your, your usual um, histogram. Okay, and another feature of the histogram is the uh, smaller spread compared to the population distribution. Right, so that is where the uh, standard deviation of um, the sampling distribution and this red one <clears throat> this is the standard deviation of the population and it turns out the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the mean is actually smaller than the population standard deviation by square root of the sample size as is depicted here right so the six um, and the numerator was the uh, pop original population standard deviation. And if we divide this standard deviation by square root of the sample size, so square root of four is two. So six over two becomes three. So the standard deviation of the sampling distribution is three. Right, that's three. <clears throat> So is it? So you're not sure about um, you're, so you're not sure about this. So you decided to change the sample size to nine to see what happened. So we repeat the same process. Take a sample of size nine now and measure the sample mean IOP. Uh, put them back to the population and pick another sample of nine. Measure the sample mean IOP. So you do this another 998 times to collect 1,000 sample mean IOPs and construct a histogram of those 1,000 sample means and see what happens. And voila. Now the blue histogram is the distribution of the sample mean of size 9. Uh, again, the mean of the sampling distribution um, is again on top of the population mean of 17, but the standard deviation got smaller than before by how much? By the square root of the sample size of 9. See here? Um, so square root of 9 is 3, so 6 over 3 is 2. So um, Let's just do this one more with a different sample size. Uh, this time, uh, we're going to increase the sample size to 36. And as expected, the mean of the yellow histogram is the same as the population mean with a smaller, even further um, smaller standard deviation than the population standard deviation by the square root of sample size of 36. So, uh, you know, square root of 36 is 6, so 6 over 6 is 1. So as you can see, if we increase the sample size to the infinity, then the standard deviation of the histogram will approach to 0, and the sample mean will become exactly the same as the population mean. So in a nutshell, this is basically what came to be known as the central limit theorem. So here is um, kind of a formal description of central limit theorem by Laplace, um, who actually um, rediscovered the central limit theorem. So he's not the first one who actually um, uh, theorized it. It was the de Mavoir, um, who was the uh, predecessor of Laplace, but um, he actually rediscovered it and then um and organize it in his one of his um, publications so what the central limit theorem is a bit mouthful but i'll just uh, read it through it verbatim so when sample means each consisting of a sample size n randomly selected from a population are obtained from an unlimited series of random sampling with replacement and the resulting distribution of the sample means, also known as sampling distribution of the mean, 
will be approximately normal, normal as in normal distribution, regardless of the shape of the population distribution from which the samples are drawn as the sample size n increases. So according to the central limit theorem, a sampling distribution of the means uh, displays the following behaviors. So the mean of the sampling distribution, um, please note that this is not the individual sample means, will be the same as the population mean. So here the um, mu represents the mean of the sample means. Okay, so here the data are sample means, not the individual values. Okay, and so if you have large enough, um, a lar la large um, enough sample size, then it'll approach to the population mean, right? So the mean of the sample distribution will be the same as the population mean. So that's one of the properties of the sampling distribution. And the other behavior of sampling distribution is that the standard deviation, so here sigma represents the standard deviation of the sample mean x bar, right, equals to the population standard deviation. So this is the population standard deviation, right? and divided by the square root of n, which is sample size. And this standard deviation of a sampling distribution of means, also known as standard error of the mean. So standard error of the mean, so standard error of the sample mean, um, is um, denoted as SEM or SC for short. And this is basically the standard deviation of a sample, uh, uh, that's all of the sampling distribution. And the size of the standard error will give you a measure of how precise your estimation of that population mean. So, if you think about it, the standard deviation of a sample will provide how close uh, the data in the sample are to the uh, sample mean on average. However, to say something about the population mean from the sample mean, we need to know how close the sample mean is to the population mean. Um, and the standard error of the mean will provide us with that information. So the sample means will vary less from sample to sample by the square root of the sample size according to the central limit theorem. So what that means is that if you have a large sample size, then your estimation of the population mean will become more and more precise. Right? But on the other hand, a large standard error of the mean, SEM, means that your sample might not be very representative of the population. Another property of the sampling distribution is its uh, robust normality. So intuitively, if the sample, um, sample generating population is normally distributed, then you would think that the resulting sampling distribution will be normally distributed too. However, um, even if the population is not normally distributed, sampling distribution will be more or less normally distributed with reasonably large sample size. So here we um, say reasonably large. So uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, larger than 30 or more sample size. That's what we're talking about as a kind of a ballpark number. So here we have a um, simulation of the property um, where the top pinkish distribution is the original population from which uh, sample means will be generated.
So obviously it is not normally distributed as you can see, but rather it looks more um, like an exponential distribution. So imagine that we simulate a central limit theorem using this population to see how the shape of the distribution, sampling distribution changes as a function of sample size. So on the left uh, is showing a sampling distribution constructed from thousands of sample means uh, with a size of five drawn from that top distribution. And as is obvious, the, uh, the shape of the sampling distribution um, does not look very normal, but positively skewed or the skew to the right. But as we increase the uh, sample size to 30 and the resulting sampling distribution in the middle looks more or less normal with a slight, a slight positive skew. And finally, as the sample size increased to 100, and the sampling distribution on the right looks almost normal. So um, if our sample size is large enough, say over 30, then we can assume that, that the sampling distribution, not the individual samples, will be approximately normal. And what, and what that means is that all the properties of normal distribution will apply to this sampling distribution. So for example, uh, we know that the true population mean will be located somewhere within plus minus two standard error of the mean of the sampling distribution, which is, um, so the two standard error of the mean is basically the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, uh, given the sample mean and the size. So when the sample means not the sample data follow normal distribution with a population mean of mu and the standard error of the mean, then it can be standardized using the Z transformation as we learned before. Because the uh, standard error of the mean is the standard deviation of sampling distribution, uh, then all the properties of normal distribution are applied to this distribution too, such as 95% of the sample means will fall around the population mean. So here, um, you know, you have to just to be careful about this one. So X bar, when X bar follows the yeah, normal distribution with the mean of the population mean, right? And then this sigma over square root of n is the standard deviation of sampling di distribution, right? So this is the standard deviation of the sampling means, distribution of the sampling means, which is known as standard error of the mean, right? So that's S-E-M. And we can standardize by subtracting the sample means, so which is our data now, from the population mean, and divide this by the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the mean, which is the um, standard error of the mean. Right? Then, it will... So we can find... So this is a plus minus one standard error of the mean. And you will find 68% in the middle. And within plus or minus two standard deviation, that uh, you can find the 95%. Okay, so. That will become 95%. Ninety-five, uh, and so on, and within plus minus two, a uh, three standard error of the mean, you will find ninety-nine point seven percent, and especially you know this interval within plus minus two standard error of the mean is known as ninety-five percent confidence interval. So here the CI 
um, stand for confidence interval. Um, so this was first suggested by a um, statistician named Jersey Neiman in 1937 to report as a metric indicating how accurate our estimate of the population mean will be given the sample mean and the size. So the uh, confidence interval is an observed boundary from the sample within which the unobserved parameter, so in, in, this case, uh, in this case population mean, would fall with a given confidence level. And in practice, we report our sample mean as our estimation of the population mean along with the confidence interval to express the amount of certainty or uncertainty in the estimation. And um, you can use different levels of confidence, but 95% is the most commonly used confidence level. So in practice, um, it is a quite, um, quite a standard procedure to report 95% confidence interval along with the uh, sample mean. And it is not that difficult to calculate, as you can see from uh, the um, simple equation. So the lower boundary um, of the, uh, any percent level, yeah, so given level of confidence, the lower boundary of the confidence interval is x bar, which is a sample mean that you measured, minus the z. This is kind of uh, the confidence level you're going to use. And most commonly used confidence level is 95%, right? Uh, which correspond to the z score of 1.96 or, you know, round it up to 2. And you multiply this by standard error of the mean, which is basically the standard deviation of the sample and then square root of n. So that's, um, so because you don't know the population standard deviation, right? You use the sample standard deviation instead uh, as if this is the population mean, I mean population standard deviation, sorry. And then you divide this by the square root of the sample size that uh, of your sample, right? So that is the lower boundary, and the upper boundary is just to add this amount right to the sample mean. Then you will have the upper boundary of um, the confidence interval. So for the ninety-five percent confidence interval, it is basically sample mean plus minus two standard error of the mean, right? So that's all there is to it. And given the same level of confidence interval, say you have um, two sample means, and then you calculate the 95% um, confidence interval for both uh, sample mean. And if you have wider confidence interval, that indicates your sample mean is less um, representative of the population mean. On the other hand, if you have narrower confidence interval, right, then that means uh, your estimation of the population mean from the sample mean is quite accurate. Okay, so this is almost like a rhetorical problem, but if you have a large confidence interval, that means you're not very confident. If you have you know, small, small confidence level, then that means um, you are confident about your estimation. Okay. And also, given the same sample mean, um, if you increase the uh, the confidence level say from 95 percent to 99 percent then obviously your confidence interval gets larger wider right given the same sample mean because so you become more conservative about um, your estimation by increasing the level of confidence
Okay. So, um, mm, oh, right. And it is also common to report plus minus one standard deviation instead of a 95% confidence interval along with the sample mean. Uh, but if you do that, uh, then it has actually slight, slightly different um, meaning compared to the confidence interval. So they serve kind of a different purposes uh, and that, you know, many people are not very attentive to. So if you want to indicate the average variability of the data or observations in the sample, then you will use standard deviation. On the other hand, if you want to indicate the uncertainty, the amount of uncertainty you have in the estimation of the unknown population mean, then you will report the confidence interval. So um, let's calculate the 95% uh, confidence interval um, using a kind of a, an example, right? So here, um, let's say that you measured um, the intraocular pressure of a sample uh, the size of with the size of um, 36 um, patients. And you calculate the, um, the average intraocular pressure for this uh, sample and also standard deviation. So when you have a sample like this, um, you can calculate the 95% confidence interval by calculating the, um, the lower and the upper limits or the boundaries. So let's just start with lower boundary first. So that's X bar minus Z star times um, standard deviation. So I'll just say S over square root of N, right? So you just have to plug in and the number you obtained from your sample. So X bar here is 17 minus, because we're calculating um, the 95% confidence interval, the Z star will be 1.96, but you know, uh, for the sake of um, easier calculation, I'll just use two, okay? And the standard deviation is three over 36. Right, so that becomes 17 minus, and what's inside the bracket? So square root of 36 is six, so that's two, and cancel each other out. So we are left with one. So lower boundary is 16, right? So then upper boundary is basically the same, but you just add the uh, amount in the bracket. So that becomes 17 plus one, and that is 18, right? So that, that, is the um the quantity from the bracket and it doesn't change right so we can just add this amount uh without having to calculate it again right so that's the lower boundary and upper boundary of um uh, this sample mean right so sample mean is 17 so x bar is 17 with 95% CI, and you use square bracket to, oops, report 16 and 18, lower boundary and upper boundary. See, so this is an interval, and you know that the sample mean should be located inside this 95% confidence interval. And because we're assuming the normal distribution, and the boundary should be symmetrical around the sample mean. If it is not, then there's something wrong. 
And also, if you don't see the sample mean inside this, um, within this interval, 95% confidence interval, then also there's something wrong with the calculation. So um, you can double check um, if your calculation of 95% confidence interval is correct or not by uh, placing the sample mean within uh, the, uh, the confidence interval you calculated. So let's just then draw an error bar using this 95% uh, confidence interval. So um, once you have the 95% confidence interval, and then sometimes, especially when you have um, kind of a two or more groups to compare, then the, the error bar um, representation of your data is a uh, very good visualization uh, because it gives you kind of a quick information about the difference between these uh, uh, groups. Anyhow, um, we're going to just talk more about this error bar um, visualization later on when we're talking about the uh, t-test, but it is very easy to create an error bar. So here on the y-axis, we have um, the integral pressure, right? And you draw a bar, so erect a bar corresponding to the sample mean here, right? So that is 17 millimeter mercury. And then, so from this bar, you add, um, oops, add a line above and below the sample mean of which length correspond to two standard error of the mean. Right, it is plus minus two standard error of the mean. That is the 95% confidence interval. CI. Okay, so that's basically what it is, 95% confidence interval. And sometimes you can see that there is, um, you know, stopping bars, like the horizontal stopping bar, but this is an optional. You don't have to have that. And even you don't even have to have this, um, the bar around it. You can just um, omit this. Right, because you know that the mean is exactly in the middle of the 95% confidence interval. Um, sometimes people don't include this bar. They only add error bar because um, that actually conveys enough information about the sample mean. So that is, so this upper boundary is 18, right? That's what we calculated before. And then lower boundary is 16 there, right? So this is how to create an error bar. And then now we're gonna go to the summary.